Hey, this is Matt Milham, the deputy editor of Fine Home Building Magazine. Welcome everybody to our discussion today on roofing for extreme storms and wind. We've got some great panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. The discussion today is sponsored by Huber Engineered Woods, maker of zip system sheathing and tape, as well as Advantech subflooring. What we're going to talk about here dovetails with another presentation Huber will have going on in their own booth today with Matt Reisinger and one of our other guests here. So you may want to check that out as well if you if that hasn't already happened. Um, so what we're going to talk about here today is roofing, specifically roofing to withstand more frequent, more extreme storms. The number one cause of homeowners insurance claims is wind and hail. Um, as, as storms get more powerful and common, the risk of damage to homes and other structures is increasing. Roofs take the brunt of it. Researchers, product developers, and builders all have a stake in finding the cause of these roof failures and coming up with solutions to mitigate those failures and impl implementing those on homes. And that brings me to the folks that we have with us here today. Uh, first is Fred Malik. He's the Managing Director of Fortified Building Products at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. IBHS is basically an insurance industry funded building science organization that investigates why and how buildings fail in extreme storm events and develops ways to prevent catastrophic losses. If you're a regular reader of Fine Home Building, you've probably heard of IBHS's Fortified program, which is a voluntary construction and re-roofing program designed to strengthen homes and commercial buildings against specific types of severe weather, such as high winds, hail, hurricanes, and tornadoes. We also have Ben Murphy, owner of Ben Murphy Company in Foley, Alabama, uh, and his company has used the Fortified, Pro the Fortified Program standards on hundreds of roofs and dozens of homes. If you're in his neck of the woods and you want a roof or a house that will stand up to storms, Ben's your guy. Uh, we also have Matt Minchu, who is the general manager for Zip System Roof Applications. Uh, he's been with us here before on the Heim Fine Home Building podcast, so you probably are familiar with him a little bit. Um, and he is here to talk about Zip's products specifically and how they uh, can be wrapped into this uh, fortified system. And we also have Chris Clark, managing, who's the manager of project. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can get this right. Chris Clark, manager of product engineering at Huber Engineered Woods. He leads the technical teams. And if you're someone who uses their products and calls in with a question, it's Chris and his team that are likely getting you the answers. Is that pretty accurate, Chris? That Yes, that is correct. Okay. Have you heard pretty much every question there is to hear? Yes. Yes, we have. <laughs> some Some I won't repeat, but uh, but yeah, we definitely uh, heard them all, heard them all. So uh, people like to use our products in many different applications, some not even designed for. So <laughs> yeah, I've seen some guys come up with uh, like roof racks that they make out of mm -hmm. Zip System. That's a pretty cool thing that I want to do one day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we're here today to talk about, you know, the wind damage and storm damage that's happening to roofs. I mean, this is, as far as I can tell, looking at insurance industry data, like the number one cause for claims that people have, uh, you know, it, so it's something that obviously is happening a lot. Where are, where is this damage happening? I mean, is it just isolated to parts of the country that we think of um, as being particularly prone to these extreme storm events or is it happening all over the place? Well, you know, I can talk uh, from, from an IBHS perspective. Uh, you know, we, we see this kind of damage uh, across the country. You know, we've got uh, an increase in frequency and duration. We've got these, these storms that are just dragging and lagging on uh, that are coming across the coast. We had a derecho last year that ripped through the center, center part of the United States through Iowa, there were hundred mile plus winds. Um, severe convective storm season happens every spring. Uh, so there really isn't a place that can escape roof damage uh, caused by high wind. Matt, to build on Fred's point, there's a uh, report that NOAA puts out every year where they track uh, storms where the damage exceeds a billion dollars. And unfortunately, that trend's been growing every year. And last year was a record with uh, 22 of those events. And it's interesting that seven of them were hurricanes. And I think that, that that kind of is front of mind for a lot of folks, but at the same time, eight of them were severe thunderstorms in the Midwest and, and Southeast. So, you know, when we think about the, uh, the threat of storm related damage and the impact uh, to people and homes, um, really it's all over the place. It's not limited to the coast. Yeah. 
And I mean, from what I understand, the codes are going to be updated with like new wind maps to be able to, I guess, sort of capture some of this, you know, I guess, developing weather situation, like the, the fact that the climate's changing and that these things are becoming more widespread. Is that, are those code changes, do you know, just uh, because of new data coming in or is it, are there long-term trends um, that have kind of informed that maybe what they had in the past wasn't good enough or <laughs> or maybe it just like what things haven't changed that much and they just realized they needed to get better or do you know well i think the the building code uses a resource published by the american society of civil engineers it's asce 7 mm -hmm. and you know each time the code it, it goes through its three-year update cycle there's usually a parallel uh event happening where asce is continuing to look at seven and update its wind speed maps. And, and actually in the current version of the code prior to 2021, they had made a move to go to ASCE 716, uh, which is the current version, but they, they did not fully integrate all of the changes that came along in the 716 version. The 2021 version of the code simply integrates all that ASCE 716 piece. So now that that is all back cohesive and, and tied together like it has been in previous code years. So. Um, but I, having said that, I, you know, ASCE, ASCE um, you know, they have a panel of, of structural engineers, they get together, they do look at the data, they see what's going on, they, they look at the, 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 the trends, and, and they try to anticipate how they could make those wind speed maps better. In addition to the, to the miles per hour that gets represented there that, that's used as a tool, they also provide guidance uh, that gets referred to um, that, that helps to calculate design pressures. And that's, that's really one of the things that, that, you know, I know Chris knows a lot about and, 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 you know, we, one of the things that maybe isn't as transparent to the industry is that, you know, how the wind acts by creating loads on the entire roof system is, is really important. And so you can't just pay attention to the wind speed number. You've also got to take a few other things into account. And, and so those resources uh, in ASCE uh, seven, you know, make it possible for, for, folks that are following the code to, to really know what to do. Okay. So we're seeing these winds happening in more places. What is happening to roofs? What, like, what is the wind actually doing? And is it just the action of the wind itself or is it sort of like a shortfall of the products or what's going on? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think think what we're seeing, uh, like uh, Fred said, I mean, I think these wind events and uh, the the design of these, the the wind events are becoming more commonplace in in more areas, and therefore, maybe the the code wasn't up to date on the new ASCE seven wind design, and and so therefore, some of these uh, failures are happening because it, it wasn't. I won't say that it wasn't thought of, but it wasn't in the design to to put a added. Um, fastening schedule into the roof sheeting. And so when you get those higher wind events, it's, it's ripping that roof sheeting off. But once you get a break in that roof sheeting, you're now getting a, you're pressurizing that home and allowing more wind to really kind of come in and just pull everything off. Um, and then, so once that starts to happen, it's, it's kind of a domino effect from there. It just really kind of takes over and destroys the, the structure. So if you can protect that, that what the layer of the roof, um, from getting ripped off, um, you can really kind of save a lot of the, the damage that's the, that results from that happening. Um, and uh, so I think that's where the, the code is really trying to drive uh, to build these structures safer and, and more resilient uh, so that so they can have a longer lasting life uh, with the structures in general. Okay. You know, Matt, I think, you know, for any of us who have, uh, you know, been in a neighborhood or seen images after a storm, probably understand seeing blue tarps on roofs and otherwise the home seems fine. So I think, you know, oftentimes, and uh, IBHS has done a lot of research into this as well. The first thing to go is the roof covering. So the shingles are ripped off. Uh, the underlayment fre frequently goes with that. The, uh, the wall uh, covering is the next thing to go. And then after that, you got to start thinking about the, uh, the structure of, of the roof as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I think on the topic we're discussing today, really the, the a key issue is what happens when the roof covering fails. Yeah, well, right. we're, we're four months uh, removed from Hurricane Sally. And, you know, we're the 15 year roof cycle that we have down here, you know, with the, the fortified system having the class eight shingles, the class eight shingles held up just fine during this. 
the, the roofs that were 12 to 15 years old, you know, had catastrophic damage, were gone, destroyed. So, you know, the, one of the, the things that's happened with the fortified is all the local things, uh, cities here have adopted the fortified as a kind of a baseline for where the roofs are going to be. And uh, it's allowed every, everybody that's going back has to do follow the with the, the sealed roof deck, the ice, the ice mortar shield, the uh, class eight shingles um, is really, you know, pushed forward. So I mean, hopefully we won't have another event, but in case we do, you know, everybody can feel good with those class eight shingles on there. Yeah, and Matt, that's a, you know, that's a really important point. I think both Matt from Huber and, and, and Ben talked about it. So, you know, what we see, the, the roof just is like a lot of things in the house. It's a system, right? So it starts with the, with the roof deck, and then you've got layers of, of the system that get applied to it. And, and one of the things that Mother Nature is, is really, really good at is exposing weaknesses. And, and you know, as soon as it finds a, a vulnerability, it, it tends to really pick away at that. And then, then you get a cascade of failures. And, and, and so... Like Matt Minch, you mentioned, you know what we what we do see is ninety percent of homes that file a claim have some sort of roof damage, and the bulk of those are are roof cover failures that ultimately lead to water intrusion. And and you know the, the so that sealed roof deck technique, which has made it into the code finally, which has been fortified for a long time, uh, is is designed to provide like a belt and suspenders kind of approach for to overcome some of the product limitations I mean, shingles, you know, they are, they are exposed 365 days a year, you know, they, they, they wear differently depending on how much UV they're seeing and, and all that kind of stuff. And so eventually they are going to have challenges. I mean, they, they just will. And, 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 uh, uh, and when you get into the more, uh, the more potentially durable solutions like metal tile or other kinds of roof covers, uh, then installation re really becomes super important. You got to get, you got to spec it right. And then you got to install it right because the, the product is capable of holding up for, for a long period of time. But either way, um, you know, in our history of, of looking at post damage, the unfortunate thing is, is that I don't even have to leave my office. You tell me what the wind speed was and how long that storm lasted. I can tell you where you're going to see what kind of damage. It's that predictable. We, we just know based on, on the, the, the conditions and the characteristics of the storm, the kind of damage you'll see. And that's what we can, we can do something about is, is we can change that pattern. And what is, what is that damage? Like, where does it start? Yeah, so so like Matt said, you know, the, the lower wind speeds, even be be below design wind speed, we, we start to see shingle failures that haven't sealed, and that's a big characteristic of shingles. It has to really operate properly in order for it to be long, have a long life. The, if the the roof shingles aren't sealed, we we can start to see failures at as low as sixty miles, seventy miles an hour. So that 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 lower wind speed, tropical storm, severe thunderstorm. Uh, cat one hurricane, that's where you're seeing roof cover failures and you start to see the underlayment go and you've got water intrusion. Uh, you start to get into the upper end of cat one and, and lower ends of cat two, you do start to see um, some of that wall cladding failure. You, you start to see things like your drip edge failing, uh, the, the, the wind being able to get, get up under the roof deck. And then as you progress up into the higher end of cat two and, and into cat three, that's when you can start to really see some of the, the roof deck failures that, that Chris Clark was talking a little bit about. And once that happens and houses start to pressurize, then, then, then the, the cascade of failures just gets really dramatic. And, and that's when we get, we get, yeah, you have real problems. And what are the components of the fortified roof system? So you have a sealed deck. What does that look like? Yeah, so everything starts with picking a good durable sheathing and making sure it gets fastened right. And Zip's got some great products, um, but making sure that you've got a minimum thickness of seven sixteenths is, is really crucial. More meat to, you know, makes, gives you a better chance of, of, of being able to handle additional load and fastening. Is, Go ahead. Is the thickness both for holding the shingles down and holding the panel to the rafters or, or trusses, or what is that about? Yeah, the, the, the sheathing's more about giving a good substrate for, for whatever the roof covering is going to be that's going to be installed on top of it. Okay. Um, you know, you, you do have to have enough, uh, enough of, a, of a substrate that the fastener for the roof product, whatever that happens to be, gets a good bite and, and can hold uh, okay. under the, those loads. But then you asked specifically about the sealed roof deck, and 
I certainly don't want to talk uh, the entire time. So I'll just give you some brief things about the, the sealed root deck and then uh, the folks from Huber can get into their specific product that meets this requirement. But essentially there's, there's a few different ways you can get there. You can use a, a, a product like Zip that has a water resistive layer that's fused to the panel in a, in a uh, compatible tape. They have a great tape that goes with that system that seals the roof deck seams. That, and that's really the crucial part, cut, keeping those seams covered, even if the roof cover gets lost. You can use a, a separate system where you have two separate layers. You've got a, 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 a tape layer on the seams and then you've got a, a durable underlayment, like a synthetic underlayment or a heavier felt, 30 pound felt. You can use a fully adhered membrane. Ben referred to that as the ice and water shield. That's, you know, lots of people know that. You can do a fully adhered membrane across the entire roof. There are some things you wanna, you wanna take into consideration if you're gonna make that decision, but you can use that as an option. And then finally, you know, if you have a, a roof cover like a cedar shakes uh, or shingles, and you, you want to use a, a, a good durable uh, sealed roof deck system, then a two ply thirty system can it can work really well in in that specific application. Okay, and is there when you're adding extra layers, does that add complication? Does it are there more <laughs> ways that things can go wrong when you do that? If you like steer away from something like Zip, which is relatively easy. I don't know. I'm assuming most people know what this, what zip system is, but it's essentially but like an OSB panel with a, a covering on it that makes it basically a, that is a, a WRB. And then you apply a, a seam tape over all of those seams to kind of seal it up. And that stuff is a, has a pressure sensitive adhesive that works really well, you know, is designed to work well with those panels and does a fantastic job of sealing them up. Um, did you guys design it with this kind of thing in mind or <laughs> like it, it, did you design it to be sort of like an ideal fortified pro product or what was the idea? Yeah. I mean, I think in general, uh, I mean, when we created zip, uh, I, I don't believe fortified was uh, a program that was at least um, commercialized yet. I mean, it may have been in, in its infancy state, but, um, but it wasn't a, a sole, uh, I guess, target for us uh, up front. Um, I mean, the idea behind it was uh, just to make it easier to, to get a, a better performing roof in general um, than uh, the traditional systems gave you. Um, and uh, the, the, the idea behind Zip was, well, what's, what's the weak spot? What's the, what's the most vulnerable material in a roof application? Well, it's your, your felt or underlayment. It's not very durable. Um, high wind events during construction can damage it, which can be a, a, a pain for builders to come back and rework. Um, but um, I think as the Fortified program came into uh, fruition, um, it, really, it really highlighted ZIP um, in that we, had, we were addressing that that sealing of the seams and, and protection against uh, moisture intrusion during a high wind event if you lose uh, your finished roof covering. Um, and so it, it was kind of a, um, I call it, it was kind of a luck of, luck of the draw, uh, so to speak. Uh, but it was, uh, it was one that we were, I think that we were happy about for sure. I don't know, Matt, you want to add anything to that? I think that's it. Yeah, the, the initial kind of innovation was how to integrate the underlayment into a structural panel. And it was about better performance in the field, you know, easier installation, faster installation. That, that was the initial thought. And, um, you know, as this topic of resilience has become more, more relevant, um, you know, we've, we've realized that it has a, a really natural fit with um, creating a sealed roof deck. One of the things that I'd like to, to give Matt, uh, Ben an opportunity to chime in here, you asked a really good question, Matt, about uh, about the the different techniques and in, in the different layers. And and Zip is a great product when you're when you're putting on a new roof in particular, and you're not you know you're not putting on new sheathing. Ben does an awful lot of re-roofing, and, and so I, I'm sure he's got some thoughts and opinions on uh, on sealed roof decks over existing deck. Yeah. yeah. So. Typically what we do is we do a full ice and water shield over the entire roof deck. Um, you know, we, uh, over the years we did, we taped some of the seams and used a uh, synthetic felt over it. But for, for the applications we've had and some of the requirements we've had with some programs we're doing, the, the full ice and water shield membrane over the roof deck has been the best for us. So we do it 100% of the jobs. I mean, we don't, we don't charge any more for it versus taping the seams. So, our, our new builds and our rebrews, we do full ice and water shield. Is that, you, you don't charge any extra for that, really? 
Mm-mm. No, because what we did, I mean, uh, taping this, in, regardless of what you do down here, you have to have a sealed roof deck building code, period. So, um, you know, option, the first option is taping the seams and putting synthetic over it, which turns out to be pretty labor intensive because you've got to tape the seams and come back and roll the, the um, synthetic over it and nail it down. But the ice and water shield, you just got one one step. And so the offset there, it, it costs me a little bit more, but we don't we don't charge any more for it. And so it makes it a lot easier on our guys that every job's the same. There's no, no uh, you don't have to, to tell them which job's got to do what. So we do full ice and water shield and everything across the board. Are all of your jobs now basically fortified jobs when you do when you're doing roofs? So uh, in 2014, we decided that 100% of our jobs are fortified, regardless of its new construction or re-roofs. We've been involved in some grant programs that kind of got the fortified program up and rolling here pretty well. So um, we just made it across the board. Everything we do is fortified. We, when we re-roof a house, we give, we provide the the service of giving the third party evaluator. Um, involved in getting the homeowner their certificate. So as soon as we walk out of the job, we submit everything to the IBHS and give the homeowner their certificate. So yeah, 100% of what we do is fortified. Okay. So there is a verification aspect to this as well then? Yeah, yeah. there's a third the third party evaluator and Fred can probably talk a little bit more about it than, than me, but yeah, third party evaluator comes out and, and verifies that we've uh, installed everything to the, the fortified standards. Cool. Yeah, that, so that's the, the, you know, Ben's, Ben's really perfected his process and he's got a good relationship with a, a few folks that are there. And, and, and so what my team does is, is we work with the third party evaluators and the roofing contractors. They submit a, a completed form to us, which includes pictures, documentation of the products that was put on that were put on. Uh, and then I have a team of, of auditors that then reviews those that are submitted for to make sure that the, the compliance requirements have been met. And then we send out a certificate and that certificate, particularly there in Alabama, unlocks a number of different incentives, uh, and most notably some insurance incentives uh, that are pretty significant. We're seeing more and more of those kinds of incentives. Ben mentioned grant programs. There's uh, there's about $40 million in capital that'll be put out the door this year in, in 2021 in, in grant in the form of grant programs, uh, uh, incentivizing people to, to replace their existing roofs with a more durable system uh, or repair their roofs if they happen to get damaged by a, uh, by a, a qualifying event. So um, there's a lot of, of, of capital and there's a lot of innovation in this space that's coming in now, which is, which is really encouraging to see because that just means that Fewer and fewer people are gonna are gonna have to uh, unnecessarily suffer, um, uh, you know, after these events. And how? What are the costs involved in? I mean, like, how much more expensive is it to do a fortified roof than using the old building practices that you did before, Ben? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I don't keep my finger on it because we've been <laughs> 2014, so. You know, I don't, we, you can't even go in and buy felt here anymore. I mean, you, it's all, it's all synthetic. So yeah, I, at this point, I don't even have any idea. <laughs> so do you have here, here? It's not much. Cause I mean the, the, uh, you know, the, it'd be just material cost, you know, the labor is going to be about the same regardless. Okay. So every roof down there, so you don't have a problem then trying to convince people to, to sort of upgrade to this standard that isn't as well, uh, regular I mean, else. That, the IBHS has done a great job down here promoting this, the um, the fortified program. I mean, every city has pretty much adopted theirs as, as their minimum roof standards. I mean, you walk in every single building apartment here, there's a IBHS pamphlet, you know, sitting there at the at the uh, at the front desk. So, and then when Alabama gave the insurance savings incentives, um, you know, for uh, fortified roofs, silver and gold, they you know, it really opened people's eyes because, I mean, you can save in some of the admitted carriers 25% off your homeowner's policy, which is your wind and hail. And, you know, down here, you know, you, you can have 2000 to $10,000, you know, insurance premium every year. So, uh, you know, once the, once the ball started rolling with it, uh, you know, just about everybody, I mean, you know, everybody asks for it when they do it. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have to get the fortified certificate uh, on every house, but it's uh, since we give it to them, you know, it, it, everybody just goes for it. It's, it's you know, pretty much common. Everybody knows everything about it. And there's other aspects to this as well, right? So you've got 
bigger drip edges or at least with a, a taller roof leg, I guess, than some people might be used to. You've got metal up the rakes, you've got uh, starter strips, uh, you know, both along the eave and up the, up the rakes. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit about that and how that sort of integrates with the rest of the roof? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, the eave metal is, is basically, it's a, it's a different nailing pattern. It's just a tighter nailing pattern. Uh, it's actually, um, and then you have the uh, starter strip. You need the starter shingle or the rolled starter. We do a uh, rolled starter. And um, then, you know, then you got the full ice and water shield on top of that. Then your, your uh, shingles, which, um, you know, you, we got six nails per shingle here. Um, the, in, any kind of accessory has got to meet the TAS 100A, uh, which is the high wind um, uh, standard. So, uh, yeah, it's just all those components that kind of go together with, you know, the renailing of the roof deck, which Fred talked about earlier. You know, when we tear a roof off, we come back and, and put a, a tighter nailing pattern with uh, number eight ring shank nails and then the ice and water shield. So, and, you know, there's a little bit of uh, fortified deals, a little bit on every single thing on the roof, but uh, not enough to, to make everything, you know, cost so much you can't afford it. Yeah. And can, how does this all affect venting? I mean, if you're sealing the roof deck, do you do you just leave the roof vent out? You still vent, I imagine, in some places yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you still have your, your ridge vents, your off ridge vents, just typically like anything else. But those vents have to meet that high wind standard. That TAS 100. So, that's like that's a Florida standard, I think, right? Like out of Broward County. Is. Yeah, yeah. It, yep. it's, a, it's a Florida standard. And really what it's designed to do is both deal with wind, but but also wind driven rain. And, and it ultimately, I mean, the best way to think about it is on those vents, you, you end up having a, a little leg on the inside of the vent that when the wind driven rain is forced into the vent, there's something there to act as a barrier that pushes it back out through the weep holes. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that that's becoming more and more common. Uh, but it originated out of uh, out of Florida. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you know Ben Ben so so in it, it has been using this stuff for so long. You know, he talks so casually about it. But one of the things that uh, uh, you know that it, it, he he remembers what it looked like when we first got there. You know, back in 2014, and drip edge wasn't all that common on on every single roof. And so now we're starting to see more and more folks put that drip edge on. And that's because when you have a, a good quality sheathing product, I mean, a zip product, you know, you want to make sure that leading edge gets protected so you don't get water that's driving, you know, past the subfascia and causing that that leading edge to 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 uh, to deteriorate. Also, you know, that we've done a, a lot of study. We're not unique in this regard, but, you know, the wind tunnel behind me, we've been able to really look at complete systems and measure design pressures in different places along the roof. And it's been pretty well known for a long time, but the edges are where the highest pressures are, go to work on a roof. And so the drip edge really provides an anchor point where the rest of the layers of the roofing, uh, uh, you know, the, the drip edge goes over top of the, the, the underlayment and, and gets sealed to the underlayment, either through the rolled starter or by placing a, 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 uh, uh, a traditional starter in a bed of mastic you seal the top edge of that drip edge so that your water can't get underneath it and cause the deck to, to, to rot. But uh, it provides an anchor point now that the, the, that next course of shingles, that starter course seals down and then the first course of shingles can seal to the starter. And that really gives you that reinforced edge, which makes it real hard for the wind to get up underneath that. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge point of failure, either at the eave or going up the rake. Uh, we've got some pretty interesting videos on our website that show you know those edge failures um and and uh, so keeping that that drip edge down now the other thing I, I do want to touch on there matt because this is where folks like ben and i who've been in contracting for a while you know we depend on good documentation good literature to tell us what to do when we when we need to put a system together the code says where when it where it talks about drip edge the code says you should be using 26 gauge drip edge Unfortunately, what gets stocked in a lot of places is, is 29 gauge. And, and so Fortified, you know, makes you pay attention to that little detail because it's super important. And then as Ben said, you know, we're, we, we have a prescriptive nailing pattern of four inches on center uh, in the hurricane prone areas uh, that will keep that drip edge in, in place, even in those high winds. Now, when you get away from the coast and you get into places like Iowa or Oklahoma, the, the, you can spread those nails out a little bit further. You go to 12 inches on center. Uh, but you're still using an edge metal for all the same reasons. You just don't have the same 
uh, the same types of pressures acting on, on those roofs as you do out at the coast, particularly, you know, right there on the water. And I, I know when we included some of those drip edge details in the magazine, it's probably been a couple of years since that happened, but I, we got some comments about there being some reverse laps there. But I mean, the, <laughs> I don't know if that's something that, uh, you know. Well, what, what, and that, that's a, it's a fair point. I mean, we, yeah. you know, we're, we're concerned about it too, but, but what I think people fail to see sometimes when they're looking at that, they only look at that, that particular part of the detail where it shows the drip edge over top of the underlayment that they, they don't necessarily put two and two together to see that the top of that drip edge is being, uh, is being sealed by either the fully adhered starter strip or the mastic in the, in the starter strip being embedded in it. So yeah, it can look like a, a reverse lap if you don't do the entire system, right? That's why it's so important to do the whole thing. Right. So you can't just sort of pick and choose. No, no, that's a dangerous way to go. If you pick and choose one thing, you're, you're going to miss the, the right thing. <laughs> right. And I mean, what kinds of questions do you get at Huber about implementing this kind of thing with zip system? I mean, do you have to include all of those other layers and how do you integrate them if your WRB is your roof deck? Yeah, so I mean, uh, with the zip system, uh, for example, with the, the drip edge, um, to, to integrate that, uh, to Fred's point, is you can utilize the tape um, uh, to, to basically treat that top edge of uh, the um, drip edge, and then you can do your starter strip over top of that. Um, we've seen guys uh, use, a, use a mastic instead of the tape, and it's a little bit more tedious process, a little more steps, but um, there's, there's definitely ways to do that. And some guys come up with their own version. Either they feel more comfortable with it or uh, they, uh, they, they can get it done a little bit, a little bit faster and, and quicker. Um, so it, it's all depends on the installer, but, uh, from our standpoint, you definitely need to treat that. Um, and so I think we've worked well with, uh, IBHS and, and making sure that if that does come into the question that we can, uh, we can kind of pick their brain a little bit, uh, to see how it would be better to, to integrate that in and, and hit those details for sure. And I'll tell you, I mean, from my perspective, you know, when you're talking about a product like zip, the, the, you know, a lot of times we have to we have to audit a file from a, a thousand miles away, right? We're we're not in the in the field on every single job, and so a product like Zip or or the fully adhered membrane, like like Ben was talking about, that visually that's very easy to confirm, right? And so you can you can see the color of the water resistant barrier, you can see the tape applied to it. It's uh, as long as you, you know, you're looking closely enough that you don't have any voids. And, and Huber's great about providing good installation instructions and and really pressing on that tape to activate that, that adhesive. But, you know, assuming that you're following Huber's installation instructions, you, you can, you know, that it really makes it easy on the installer. And, and it also makes it easier on, on the verifier to know, okay, I, I know what's been used there. When you use something else, which is t totally, you know, possible, um, you know, you have to dig a little bit more and, and, and get into the details to figure out, did you, did the, the, the roofer select compatible products? Because that that becomes a real a real uh, another issue. I mean, we don't we certainly don't have that issue with, with Ben, but but for for other you know in other places and with other roofers, um, you know it's it's important to coach them up on on making sure that they're selecting products that are compatible with one another, and you don't end up with uh, you know creating a problem uh, when when you, you you you're trying to solve one. Right. So does Huber have like specific starter strips and stuff that you guys want people to use then or no, we, we don't have any uh, accessory items to that extent. Most of our accessory items are, I'll call it flashing solutions or, or sealing solutions. Um, so we have uh, different versions of the tape um, in different widths, and we have a stretchable version as well. Um, and then we also have a liquid applied product, uh, which is an STPE formulation uh, or silly terminated polyether. Um, so a lot of guys like to utilize that as well. Uh, especially if they've got some uh, ornate, um, difficult roofs uh, that may be tough to, to get tape into certain corners or uh, so the, the liquid flash can really help get into those tougher areas uh, and still provide that, that same seal and, and uh, contact. And, and like Fred said, compatibility wise, um, all of our products are compatible with just about everything that you can see on a roof or, or use on a roof. So do you get a lot of calls about stuff like that? I mean, it, can someone just go to the home center and pick up, you know, any, I guess, wind rated shingle and, and pop it on your roof and use liquid flash to 
adhere to the deck on the edges. Yeah, I mean, the uh, funny thing is, is where <laughs> we we actually did. Uh, we we get those questions quite a bit. Guys are like, "Well, can I use it here?" I'm like, "Well, it's not really a test that we've done, but um, based off of every th- knowledge that we have, we don't see an issue with it." Um, and so we actually created a new video and it's actually going to be shown at IBS. So if you do stop by the booth, be sure to check it out. And it's called, will it stick? Um, and actually we took, uh, our tapes or liquid flash and applied it to many different materials and, and applications that we get questions on. And, and we just kind of did a backyard test to see if it worked and, uh, surprising enough, it worked in, in a lot of instances, um, that we were pretty confident it would, but just didn't have the official, uh, I'll call it official lab test done for it. But um, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, the, the products that we choose. Uh, we definitely want it to be uh, uh, usable across the board. We don't want to be siloed into to one application or one product, um, especially with the, uh, the accessory items that we do carry. Matt, I think a, another frequent question we get has to do with whether or not additional underlayment is needed. Yeah. Over uh, over zip, whether it's you know fortified roof or or, or a common roof, and so it's uh, typically it's a, it's a surprise to people that that layer that top layer is a code approved WRB. It's fused to the panel, and when you tape the seams, um, you know you're you're, you're good to go. Um, so th- there's some education there, and then and then a, the surprise that you can shingle directly to it um, is also a common question we get. Yep. Mm. If I wanted to get fortified, like a fortified roof on my house, who is involved beyond the contractor? <laughs> well, if you're, if you're going for a fortified roof, I mean, we've, we've tried to, to simplify it. So there's only a couple of folks that you need to, to, to really get involved. One is a fortified roofing contractor. You know, uh, folks like Ben, we, we have a training uh, a course that they can go through. We, it, we launched a virtual version last year. I mean, COVID, COVID really held our feet to the fire and made, made sure we did that. Uh, so we have a, 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 a virtual training that's available. It's, it's about two and a half hours. It's 10 modules. It's self-paced. It's broken down into some bite-sized chunks. Um, and, and then once you, you know, once you locate a, a, a fortified roofer in our directory, um, uh, you, you are required to work with a, a certified evaluator. That's the person that's going to document what you're doing and, and is ultimately going to submit a, a job file to us to, to review now, if you happen to be in an area where, where you don't have uh, a, a network of, of, of already trained roofing contractors, any roofer can participate. They, any roofer can follow the guidance. We publish the guidance. We put out a lot of uh, standard details. Uh, and so it's possible for any roofer to do it. But the key there is you have to work with an evaluator. And that evaluator, in those instances, can become a, a, a bit of a coach in addition to a, in addition to a verifier and can, can help make sure that you understand what the what the requirements are and, and what we're going to be looking for on the back end. Cause it, at the end of the day, what we don't want, we, we don't want the homeowner who, who has invested in, in this upgrade to their roof. We don't want them getting bad news uh, where, you know, their roof for some reason isn't going to qualify. And now, you know, expensive rework has to be done. So uh, the, the, the next logical question is, well, what does somebody have to do to be successful? And in, in, in if, if you're a contractor and you're watching this and, and you're thinking about participating uh, what's really key there is, is, is excellent communication. It's just, you know, communicating about what you intend to do, comparing notes, making sure that uh, the, you know, the evaluator knows what your, what your plan is, and then good communication around scheduling. Because what we don't want to do, I mean, coming from a, a, a contractor background, we've built houses for 20 some odd years before I stepped into this role. Um, you know, what we're very sensitive to is we don't want to slow the job down. I mean, guys like Ben make money but getting on the roof, getting it installed, getting on to the next roof. And so we don't want to, to, to really dramatically impact that process. So good communication about the schedule and, and partnership so that the roofer can help to gather some of the important documentation and important pictures from up on the roof. Uh, that, that good collaboration can make the job go you know, really smooth and, and make sure that there aren't any, any unintended problems uh, down the road. What, I mean, when people are going through that verification process, what are the things that are people most commonly leaving out or doing <laughs> wrong? <laughs> so the, uh, the, the biggest things that we see, so we, we've worked our way through in a lot of places. Uh, uh, when somebody chooses to use a mechanically fastened underlayment, usually over top of the tape, uh, that fastening pattern is super critical. Um, you know, that, especially if you're using a synthetic underlayment, but in any case, 
uh, if, if, if air gets underneath that and causes it to billow at all, and the fasteners are too far apart, that, that additional layer of underlayment's going off. Uh, so we have a, a, a tight uh, nailing pattern that, that usually follows the manufacturer of the underlayments uh, high wind installation nailing pattern. So you, it's six inches at the, at the laps, 12 inches in the field. And depending on how wide your roll is, you may end up with two or three rows at 12 inches in the field of, of, the, of the synthetic underlayment. But, uh, but that, that's probably the, the, one of the bigger issues that we see. Uh, the next one is, is gonna be the, uh, the, the installation of the drip edge. That, uh, that, that tends to be a, a place where, where the details uh, really need to be paid attention to and, and, and often uh, you know, are, are, take some practice to get right. And what's the issue there? So it's like a staggered W pattern sort of in a, a four inches on center, is that right? Yeah, it is. And, in the and most so, extreme situations. And, and anyway. so there's you know, you, a lot of times we'll see fasteners too far apart um, or, uh, you know, that metal comes pre-bent at 90 degrees and, you know, you got bearable roof pitches and sometimes there's some challenges uh, and, and also the thickness of your subfascia can make a difference. So sometimes there's some challenges getting enough of a, a meat up onto the roof where you can get it nailed off properly. So you know, even though the, the, the requirement is at least a two inch leg up on the, on the surface of the roof, sometimes that's not big enough. That's not enough based on the, the site conditions. And so uh, those are the kinds of things that, that take, some, uh, take some, some getting used to and some attention to detail. Um, that and, and, and one of the other things that we're, we're starting to see a bit more in, in, uh, in the coastal area uh, is that, you know, that the closer you get to a saltwater shoreline, uh, the more corrosion resistance comes into play with, with uh, some of your, your fasteners that you got to pay attention to. Um, and so, you know, that's another thing that, that folks have to, to really get used to, to paying attention to that. Some are, are really super good at it and they, they follow, you know, they follow already a good standard practice. Uh, and others, it's, it's a, a little bit uh, more of a, of a change because, you know, it, that's not something that's really well understood and, and, and well enforced by, you know, the local code jurisdiction. So um, that's one of the places where, you know, we, we, we work together to bring the, the overall quality of, of those, those decisions being made uh, up. I guess the last thing is that, uh, that starter strip connection and, and making sure that that, uh, that really gets done well. Uh, somebody, uh, said, uh, I think it was maybe Chris, um, but I saw Ben nodding a little bit that, you know, if you're using the mastic, that, that takes a little bit of finesse. I mean, I, I know a few guys that can put that stuff on wearing white shirt and white pants. I'm not one of them. I'll be wearing that stuff head to toe if I use that mastic. So, yeah. uh, but you know, making sure that you're paying attention to that. And, and, and if you're not going to use that product, using that, that fully adhered starter strip, um, is a, is a bit of a different, uh, uh, a change for, for folks that particularly want to see roof in the same way for a lot of years. Are any aspects of this getting picked up outside of the hurricane zone regions? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, you know, we, we're starting to see it more and more. I mean, it's, it's made it into the 2021 IBC and, and for any areas where the, I'm sorry, IRC and in, in any areas where the uh, wind speed gets over 130, but we've also had places like uh, Oklahoma, uh, you know, probably remember several years ago, Moore had, well, actually Moore's had two tornadoes in the last uh, 10 years uh, that were really severe, but uh, the, uh, Oklahoma has put Fortified in as a, uh, uh, a, a, something called Appendix Y in the, in the Oklahoma State Building Code. Uh, Louisiana has elements of Fortified in it. Connecticut has elements of Fortified okay. in it. Um, New York, South Carolina have wind mitigation programs that, that, uh, that also um, draw people's attention to fortified North Carolina um, has a, a substantial amount of, of incentives, both premium discounts, um, uh, grants, and uh, something called a, a, a reef endorsement, which is basically says if you have a, a 50, if your roof cover is damaged and, and uh, 50% of your roof is damaged or more and your entire, your roof needs to be replaced, then the, the, there are companies now that will pay uh, through that roof endorsement to replace the entire roof with a fortified roof at no additional expense to the, to the insured. So things like that are becoming more and more popular, uh, you know, particularly in places uh, where, um, where the, uh, away from the coast. Matter of fact, 
uh, uh, in Ben's home state there of Alabama, they've moved uh, the requirements and the incentives for, for Fortified upstate all the way up to uh, throughout the state in Alabama. So yeah, we're starting to see more and more of that happening. And it's, you know, from my perspective, and I'm, I know now I said I was going to shut up, but uh, you know, it's really nice to see that because unfortunately, you know, one of the things that I can say as much as we are a fan of the building codes and we, we like the progress we're seeing in the coastal states, um, unfortunately the code really doesn't change very much and hasn't changed very much from a wind perspective inland. Uh, and so uh, now that we're starting to see um, folks that are, you know, trying to be proactive and bring, bring elements of, of what we have showed to work in our, in our research uh, into, those, into those other states, that, that really bodes well for, for where things are headed. Um, and, and builders would be smart to get out in front of that. Um, otherwise, uh, they may find it, um, you know, forced upon them at some point. Yeah, yeah we... we um this last in 2020, we did about a hundred houses, uh, re-roofs about 300 miles inland in the Tuscaloosa and Birmingham area. It seems to be kind of, you know, in its infancy up there, but it seems to be spreading up there. Yeah. I mean, uh, definitely the Connecticut code adoption was one that was, a. Uh, it was a little surprising. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you, you don't want to think of hurricanes to be hitting Connecticut as often, but um, I mean, it's definitely there. There's not a place that's not vulnerable to some sort of high wind event or high uh, uh, detrimental weather event at some point. I mean, we've had uh, huge tornadoes in Nashville um, and, and other places that have caused a lot of damage. And, um, and I think uh, a program like the Fortified program will, will help. Um, kind of wake up some of these builders and municipalities to, to adopt something like that. And, and so I think Florida uh, last year or adopted it this year as being a requirement going forward that you have to do a sealed roof deck of some sort um, across the state. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's definitely making its way. And is that something that you guys think is going to make it into the IRC that everywhere is going to be required to have a sealed roof deck? It seems like such like a, an easy thing to do, especially if you're using, you know, a tape and panel system like you guys have. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Um, I mean, I, I can definitely see it for the coastal states making it some sort of requirement for sure. Uh, maybe Tornado Alley, uh, those areas. Uh, but I mean, I can see where states will, will start to adopt it and uh, maybe start offering to, uh, some incentives to some people that, that use that building practice. Um, and so you might see homeowners and builders really start to, to push for that to get those incentives. So I can definitely see it kind of taking on a, a whole new life uh, as, it, as, uh, as, as we start getting more and more into it and seeing some of the result of some of these homes getting built to the standard. Um, I can definitely see builders starting to adopt it more and more and homeowners getting more educated about it. And you know, on, on average, depending on the size of the home, I think to, to move from a common roof to a fortified roof, it's probably 500 to a thousand dollars, depending on, you know, the size of the home and the, the set of materials they, they go with. So, you know, for the level of protection that's delivered, by, by taking these steps, um, you know, relative to the cost of the home and the life of the home, you know, it, it, it's from that perspective, it wouldn't surprise me if it's, uh, if the trend really becomes a national one. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, a 500 to a thousand dollars. I mean, that's some people's deductible at the end of the day for an insurance claim. So, uh, I mean, why not? Yeah. And I mean, that to me, like who is mostly pushing these things to be adopted? Is it the insurance industry? Are they, I mean, obviously they can save a lot of money not having to replace people's roofs every time there's a big storm coming through. But I don't know if you know, Fred, if <laughs> if the insurance industry is, uh, itself, I mean, they're, they're funding at IBHS. They obviously have an interest in, in making this, uh, you know, I guess mitigating the risk of these failures. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, that, it's fair to say that that from a business perspective, if if losses can be reduced, then then less money gets paid out in claims. That's for sure. Um, but there's so, so there's but there's a couple of other elements that need to be taken into consideration. I mean, if if there are fewer claims being paid or less severe be, claims being paid, well, that means that fewer people are are experiencing you know traumatic levels of of, of loss and disruption. Um, 
you know, the other thing is, as as claim values start to come down, the market's competitive, you know, and, and premiums tend to, to, to be adjusted to, to the risk. And, and so, uh, you know, there's there's really opportunity there for 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 all kinds of, of transformation in the market when um, larger numbers of people are taking proactive steps to reduce their risk. I mean, it's far more common on the commercial side, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, commercial projects tend to, to really take risk analysis and, and risk adjusted uh, pricing by project uh, into account. And, and so, you know, that's pretty common when you get larger value risks in, in, in lots of square footage under one roof. Um, and it's, it, it's the same kind of discipline and the same kind of, of potential benefit now being applied on the residential in the residential space. Uh, and so, so I, the other thing is that, that, you know, the, the, the companies are willing to, to write different risks uh, when it's, it makes business sense to do that. So each company, you know, evaluates their own risk and how they, they, they underwrite in, in different locations. But uh, when you can demonstrate through a certificate from a program like Fortified that you have taken steps to, to make yourself a more attractive risk and, and, and then, then, you know, you, you have the ability to, to shop more competitively for, for your insurance. So I think all of those things are, are there, but you know, you asked who's funding in, in, in certainly insurance companies are driver um, in, in this space. Um, you know, you, you, you tend to see um, folks that are putting uh, public dollars to work in disaster recovery. Um, also uh, bringing capital, I mentioned to you before that there's about $40 million in, in capital flowing into resilience through grant programs and the like that's, that's public dollars uh, from you know state funded or or federally funded um, sources that are that are being deployed to to incentivize uh, replacement of of normal roofs uh, or common roofs uh, with with something that's more durable. So you know there's there's a, a a momentum that's picking up, not unlike what we saw with green building 10, 15 years ago. The same you know see the same kinds of characteristics starting to show up in in the resilience space. Cool. Any last thoughts? Start with Chris. No, I mean, uh, I would say definitely if, uh, if, if you're a builder out there and, and you're, you're doing a lot of work like Ben's doing, I mean, really take a look at it and, and try to differentiate yourself, start adopting some of these practices. Um, if your state hasn't already adopted it, it it's probably going to be coming soon. Um, and uh, I definitely would say go check out uh, IBHS, IBHS's website. Um, they got some really good information on there. Um, it's easily to define. Um, and yeah, and go check out Huber Wood and come check us out in the booth at Huber. See what we got going on as well. And uh, we can uh, we can definitely help you out if you got any questions. Yeah, that's a good point on those resources because I've you know been on IBHS's website and looked through the fortified documents many times myself and it is you know it's easy to get to it's easy to read it's much more accessible than even the code i think um <laughs> which yeah. is always dense but <laughs> anyway that's that's a discussion for another day um matt anything you want to add uh, you know, I appreciate the chance to be here. It's, um, you know, I think if you just look at this panel and the combination of research and installation, product manufacturing, testing, um, it's kind of a good microcosm of what it takes to um, you know, make a difference in, in some of these challenges that we're, we're talking about there. So it's, you know, it's exciting to be, uh, to be part of it and, um, you know, appreciate the chance to uh, have this conversation. Ben? Yeah, well, you know, I took a leap of faith seven years ago. We started doing it 100 percent. It's worked out well for us. And uh, I think it's definitely the future of, of the uh, with the sealed roof decks, you know, as far as uh, as, it, as it, can, it wants to take it inland. But it uh, definitely has uh, set us apart from our competition in previous years. And now that, it, you know, everybody's kind of on board with it. And, and uh, we were kind of the guys who, who kept kept doing it and pushing forward so it's been a great thing for us and you know i highly recommend anybody doing it it's it's and it's it may be a little challenging at the beginning training crews how to do things a little bit differently and how to document but uh once everybody gets on board it's it's uh it, it works well but it's a great program cool and fred yeah you know, well, i, I, I kind of <laughs> I want to follow Matt's lead and, and just say thank you. I mean, thank you to Fine Home Building for for putting a panel like this together and, and, and hearing from from voices like ours and 
you know, thanks to Huber for innovating in this space and, you know, as a contractor, making it easy for, for folks like me that aren't too bright to, to be able to be successful by, uh, you know, what, putting my granimals up on the roof, you know, following the colors and putting the tape where it belongs. And, and, uh, and, and thank you uh, to Ben, you know, we, we just really value the heck out of, of, of folks that are oriented towards delivering quality and value product uh, to their, to their customers and a high level of service. So, um, you know, thanks for bringing the, uh, us together and giving us an opportunity to, to talk to the folks that, that stop by your booth and hopefully we'll, we'll start to see some of those on our, our website and, and in the, in the program. Thanks again, Matt. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. All right, guys. Yeah. See you around. All right. All right. Take care. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.